Good evening. My name is Geoffrey Nice. And this is one of an Inner Temple series of events under the general title of Context of Law, where we make available to students, barristers, most senior members of our profession in this inn and other inns, and now to the members of the public, um, very senior lawyers from our inn, or on this occasion from our inn and one other, on contemporary subjects. And we make those events in one way and another available to the public because it's part of a general move of the inn to believe that there should be engagement by senior lawyers with everyone, including the public. Two minutes about tonight's topic, peace and justice, before I introduce uh, our speakers. Discussions about the comparative value of peace or justice at the end of internal or international conflicts may seem of significance and importance only in and to far off places. What was it to us that Idi Amin was able to leave out his life in the safe exile of Saudi Arabia, despite having killed in the most awful way some 100,000 of his own people, in such circumstances that uh, Foreign Secretary of the day, Owen, now Lord Owen, even contemplated having him assassinated. He wasn't assassinated, nor was he tried. Should we be bothered now if the North uh, Korean regime falls and Kim Jong-un and his fellow leaders are allowed to live in exile, as would be probable, in China, never being brought to justice despite an honorary bencher of this inn, one of Australia's most senior judges, Kirby, has prepared a report saying that under all circumstances, uh, that regime should be referred to the International Criminal Court, uh, referring the offenses known to have been committed in North Korea as of a gravity and nature and scale with no parallel in the contemporary world. Should we be bothered if Kim Jong-un's allowed to escape to a life of comfort and freedom if his uh, regime falls? And once the war in Syria is over, should we be that troubled by a legal process or might it be better to let bygones be bygones and spend available funds on peace building? And then finally, on this side of the discussion, there's one of our two speakers, Lord Justice Fulford, who was a judge at the International Criminal Court for some nine years, or does another person in the audience, Lord Bonamy, of this inn, who was a judge at the ICTY for many years, come to the view that really the enormous amount of money spent on bringing peace to conflicts, in the case of the Yugoslav Tribunal, billions of dollars really didn't amount to very much in what they achieved by way of uh, reconciliation and uh, construction or reconstruction of countries after conflict. Or, is there more to the significance of the deployment of justice mechanisms during or following conflicts than mere local short-term political advantage or disadvantage? Does the failure to bring to trial offenders, at least in some way, and in some conflicts, demonstrate that the world, to the world's citizens that justice is only ever an option deployed by politicians when it suits? And what would such a conception do for citizens of the world in respect of their view of the rule of law, both at home as well as abroad? And then finally, and in any event, although they often count for nothing. What about the victims? The format of this evening, as with other events of this kind, is that our two speakers will each have two sessions of 10 minutes each, so that they will speak, and then the other will speak, and, and so on, so that the process of discussion and debate begins. That will be followed by a question and answer session, which for those of you not familiar is rigidly controlled. Please reduce to 30 seconds your comment or question, and all such comments and questions can usually be reduced to 30 seconds. Do not waste time by thanking the speakers. We will do that at the end. Don't trouble with introducing yourself. And if you want to ramble on with a long exposition of your own personal hobby horse, have no fear, you will be cut short. Think of yourself more as John Humphreys asking a question um, about Brexit of a politician on the morning show. The only difference between enjoying yourself in that role and 
that of John Humphreys is that from our two speakers you will have intelligible and thoughtful answers. Our two speakers are uh, Jack Straw, master straw of this inn, uh, Labour politician who's held two of the great states of office, Home Secretary, and then uh, for four years, six years, four years. How many years? Four years. Foreign Secretary, uh, five. Five years. Five years. Home Secretary, four. Lord Chancellor, three. And then after that, he was the very first Lord Chancellor, or Justice Secretary, uh, for many centuries to come from the House of Commons. And you can see a portrait of him reflecting that fact in the next door room if you're allowed there. Lord Justice Fulford, member of the Court of Appeal um, and a former judge of the International Criminal Court for nine years, was a judge who at that court was perhaps famous for not following a party line of the court. That's assuming there ever was such a line. He is known for having given judgments that reflected the independence of a proper judge. He has another role in respect of um, security, but since I've already forgotten the title of it, I'll let him tell you about it. Jack, you go first. It's the Intelligence Services Commissioner. Uh, and if you're a Home Secretary or Foreign Secretary, uh, you used to be in fear and trepidation of what they might say about what you had done or failed to do. Uh, thank you very much, Master Nice. Um, let me just start with a, a personal reflection on your last comment, which is, uh, your suggestion that the victims uh, in all this are sometimes forgotten. I was a victim, albeit a minor one, when the a bomb went off at the Old Bailey in uh, 1973. Uh, we all, apart, the, we all, there was a bomb scare. Uh, I was in chambers uh, just up the road in Francis Taylor Building at the time. Um, uh, we were uh, all kicked out of court. Um, because they said there was a bomb, uh, apart from the prisoners, uh, who were sent to the cells and suffered no damage whatsoever, but the rest of us walked up the street to the Old Bailey and boom, the bomb went off. Uh, some people were really very severely injured. Uh, I uh, found myself flat on the floor uh, and had a, a large piece of glass in my backside. Anyway, uh, wind forward, you have the um, Good Friday Agreement, uh, which is at one level, trading peace for justice. I was not involved, and it's a historic and very, very important agreement, and uh, that was almost entirely the work of Tony Blair uh, and John Major before him, and I was not directly involved in it at all. But landing on my desk one day uh, was a, an application for me uh, to uh, effectively approve, but to make an application to Her Majesty for uh, a royal pardon uh, for the Price sisters who had uh, been responsible and convicted uh, for planting the bomb at the Old Bailey. Uh, so I said to my private secretary, this is a, it's just a bit tricky, because uh, I've long had views about these people, uh, and I was a victim, but more importantly, there were other people there who were, who were, uh, were seriously uh, victimized, injured, uh, as a result of that bomb, and, and one person subsequently died, uh, and could easily have been many more. I signed the, 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 uh, the warrant um, and off it went for approval of, uh, to the palace and the Price sisters were duly released. I've often thought about that uh, because uh, it was a good example of how uh, there were real victims, whom I was a very minor one, uh, for um, a, you know, a dreadful crime that happened back in 1973, but the judgment was made and I was part of that that uh, sometimes peace uh, would trump uh, justice. Let me deal now with the, the, the central issue which is raised by uh, uh, this, this seminar, which is about the role of uh, the International Criminal Court and the international uh, tribunals um, like that which was set up in respect of the former uh, Yugoslavia. My own judgment is that however imperfect uh, these institutions are, and however much money uh, they spend, and they've, they've, they've been incredibly expensive, uh, they do a lot more good than harm. I want to take two examples which follow directly from my um, experience as Foreign Secretary. One was in uh, respect of a, uh, a 
suspected war criminal, Gotovina, who was a Croatian accused of a series of, of uh, war crimes. Um, and he was subsequently convicted by the ICC, but subsequently acquitted on appeal. The running alongside the search for Gotovina was Croatia's application to become a member of the European Union, an accession state, and then uh, a, a full member. And when that, their application for uh, accession status was very current, um, during 2005, uh, Gotovina was in hiding in Croatia. Uh, but we thought that we knew where he was, and we also thought that the Croatian authorities knew where he was. Um, and I may, because we were, were at the presidency of the European Council at that time, uh, in the second half of 2005, um, I worked with the then prosecutor of uh, the uh, tribunal uh, and also made it clear to the Croats that if they didn't start cooperating uh, with the international authorities and with us, as, as it were, as their agents, and produce Gotovina, who they knew, and they knew where he was, they were hiding him, um, th that uh, we, the UK, would block their application and would probably continue to block it until they uh, produced him. Anyway, they did uh, produce him, um, and uh, as I said, he was arrested, uh, charged, tried, and I, I told you what the result of that was. Um, my own view is that that process, and yes, it led to an acquittal, and that's, in a sense, a good thing, because it shows that these are, are not kangaroo courts um, that, that, that are operating properly, but that uh, process huge, hugely helped to try and bring Croatia up to the minimum standards laid down at Copenhagen about how states should operate in terms of the rule of law and justice um, if they w wanted to become uh, members uh, of the European Union. Uh, and that was, in my view, also true for other applicant members uh, from the former Yugoslavia of the European Union. Now, there are none of these states in the Western Balkans, <laughs> not, um, others uh, not outside the Balkans, but uh, right on the very eastern edge of the European Union, have judicial systems uh, which would tick all the boxes that we expect them to tick. They've still got a long way to go. But their membership of the European Union is a way of forcing their um, standards up. Uh, and I, th I think that uh, the, 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 the tribunal in uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, ha has been effective as uh, at raising standards and also effective at securing a peace. Because I don't, Master Nice suggesting there is some direct dichotomy between peace and justice. Sometimes there is, as there was uh, when uh, I was faced with having to uh, sign up a royal warrant of pardon for the Price sisters, uh, but in general, I think the one can reinforce the other. The other example I give is in respect of um, Sudan uh, and President Omar al-Bashir, the president of Sudan. Uh, I took a close interest uh, in what was going on in Sudan and went to Darfur, uh, which was a site of some terrible atrocities, uh, during my period as foreign secretary. I formed the view, and which uh, plenty of people shared uh, that um, w what had been going on in um, Darfur at the behest of uh, Omar al-Bashir and his government uh, amounted to war crimes. Um, I uh, thought that there was a very good case uh, for having uh, al-Bashir and his uh, colleagues taken before the International Criminal Court. Sudan is not a state party to the ICC treaty, and therefore it could only be referred by, uh, uh, to the ICC by a decision of the Security Council. <clears throat> and I'm very pleased to say that, that uh, I was able to persuade Condoleezza Rice, who was then my opposite number, 
US Secretary of State to let uh, this resolution, which turned out to be 1593 in 2005, um, go through uh, the Security Council. The United States, for its own reasons, which they say are good reasons, is implacably opposed to uh, any kind of extraterritorial jurisdiction in respect of its forces. I say parenthetically, uh, the US is uh, not remotely opposed to uh, ensuring that uh, its own laws have extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, uh, when it comes to the international uh, banking uh, and commercial system. Uh, uh, and uh, it ensures that it, uh, that it runs uh, across the world uh, and is unapologetic about that in, in a way that can often uh, disrupt uh, international agreements like that on Iran. But anyway, I close my brackets. Um, uh, but it's just worth making that point. But however, um, that was the position of the US, and it's a position shared by um, both parties in the US. And I, uh, thank you, 10 minutes. Uh, we, we got the resolution through thanks to the US deciding to abstain. Um, Sudan uh, w was not then suddenly released to a state of grace as a result of that decision. But I think that at the margin, it helped, and it has continued uh, to help there. And that's the, 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 the final point I make, uh, Master Nice, uh, which is, as I said at the beginning, uh, the, the arrangements for international criminal justice uh, are not perfect. Uh, they are, 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 are not some kind of magic wand, but I think in, in many situations of uh, conflict and civil war particularly, they can assist um, in helping to secure peace uh, over the years and possibly in helping to restrain more egregious, egregious uh, conduct uh, by dictators. Thank you. But in the, your second contribution, Jack, I hope you may be able to justify some of those occasions when uh, justice has not yielded, uh, has not trumped peace, because that's part of the heart of this debate. Discussion, Adrian. As Charles Zeans so correctly observed, eventually everything connects. But even remembering that particular truth, it is critical not to confuse legitimate criticisms of the way international justice has been delivered with its underlying validity as at least part of the right way of resolving egregious international incidents. It is right, indeed inevitable, to concede that in more recent times, that is post Nuremberg, trials have tended to last far too long and they can be very expensive. And it is very easy to conjure up long lists of or huge rogue galleries of grim dictators and war criminals who got away with it. Monsters never brought to justice who lived out their lives sitting like dragons on a stash of stolen gold. It is also easy to deliver a blistering <coughs> attack on an imperfect system, and there are many of these <coughs> But does that necessarily mean that the underlying model should be consigned to history? I think first it's useful to have a long look over our shoulders to gain a sense of how this has developed and evolved. From very faltering beginnings to some really impressive achievements, starting perhaps with that Stuart monarch who was tried to say the least imperfectly, in the mid-17th century for a range of offences which included the war crimes of murdering civilians, torture and involuntary conscription, through to the trial of Captain Wirtz at the end of the American Civil War for his responsibility for the terrible deaths at Andersonville Prison and on to Nuremberg. Some would say the series of cases tried at 
that place established true beginning, true beginnings for an acceptable standard of international justice, and finally through to the international criminal. It's clearly critical that Nuremberg, and indeed its far less impressive twin, Tokyo, sought to impose criminal responsibility for the worst crimes committed during the Second World War. What distinguished this experiment was that the court at Nuremberg attempted to ensure that the proceedings were procedurally fair and to a not insignificant extent it succeeded in this ambition. After Nuremberg, war crimes trials gained a remarkable degree of acceptance as part of the appropriate response to atrocities committed during war. It, is, it was because important elements of this post-Second World War exercise in international criminal justice were demonstrably successful, that there was sufficient confidence to create and run the ad hoc tribunals that dominated the second half of the 2090s and the early 2000s, the Yugoslav and Rwandan tribunals and the Sierra Leone tribunal in particular, but there have been others. Their record, in my view, was impressive. At the Yugoslav court, over 160 people were indicted for a range of offences, and 90-odd people have been sentenced from 50 or more separate cases. The Rwandan tribunal has dealt with just under 100 accused, and there has been a mix of convictions and acquittals. Apart, perhaps, from those embittered by the results, or some who were perhaps too closely affected by the decisions of the tribunal, I detect that the general view, if such a thing can be discerned, is that the accused in the cases before those courts have been provided a full and fair defense, and the trial processes overall have been impressive. As at the International Criminal Court, the main credible complaint focuses on the not infrequent lack of expeditiousness and that was particularly true at the beginning of the ICTY and the ICTR, and of course, as is so often said, the expense. Yet the prosecutions at the ICTY were demonstrably even-handed in that a mix of defendants, Serbs, Muslims, Croats, and others demonstrated a desire to ensure that all those responsible for the violence faced justice although for perhaps understandable reasons, this was more problematic at the ICTR. Prosecuting a former head of state, Slobodan Milosevic, was a significant step forward, and the prosecutors generally targeted the decision makers in those events in the Balkans. It is generally acknowledged that the impact of the ad hoc tribunals would have been far greater if they had been able to address the position of the victims of the terrible crimes in the Balkans and in Rwanda in the early 1990s, and if some credible attempt had been made to provide real restitution for the wrongs to which they had been subjected. This is one of the great but extraordinarily fragile promises <coughs> of the ICC that victims will participate in the proceedings and that meaningful recompense will follow the delivery of justice. Given those adversely affected can run into thousands or even millions, this will be markedly difficult to achieve and a significant undermining factor is funding proper reparations. But as the Lubanga trial over which I presided at the ICC has demonstrated, effective representation of individuals and communities can be achieved in criminal proceedings. And the Trust Fund for Victims 
may yet be able to provide meaningful reparations to the child soldiers and their families and communities who were the victims of Thomas V. Banger's activities. Of considerable importance in the context of tonight's discussion, on the 15th of December 2017, Trial Chamber 2 of the International Criminal Court issued a decision setting the amount of Thomas Lubanga's liability for collective reparations at 10 million US dollars for conscripting and enlisting children under the age of 15 into an armed group and using them to participate actively in hostilities. And in view of his indigence, the Chamber invited the Board of Directors of the Trust Fund for Victims to examine ways of addressing the reparations order that the court had just made. Time alone will tell if this is going to be successful, but it has to be pointing the ship in the right direction. I have dwelt on this history and these figures to demonstrate that in my view, just, international justice can work, albeit there are many elephant traps. But I do not suggest there is one true model. This will always be a mixed economy, and other forms of dispute resolution can be, indeed are, extremely effective. Albeit I doubt I will ever be persuaded that the principal perpetrators of major atrocities should be allowed to walk away effectively scot-free, perhaps having admitted their crimes, but without fear of punishment before a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Even if not brought to justice, they should live out their lives under the threat of arrest and prosecution. I've just been handed an extremely impertinent note that suggests that I've reached the end of my 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to stretch it just slightly. The final point in this introductory few words that I would want to make is that, in my view, the ICC can live comfortably alongside other alternative methods of accountability. The court has been fully prepared to treat truth and reconciliation commissions, such as used in South Africa, and traditional tribal reconciliation mechanisms as deployed in Darfur, as contributing potentially decisively to the decision as to whether the court should launch prosecutions at all, given that these alternative methods can be such an important part of the fabric of reconciliation for societies. Similarly, the court will take into account the credibility of transitional justice mechanisms, such as that currently being used in Colombia, which established the innovative and extremely interesting special jurisdiction for peace, which could form the subject matter of a lengthy speech in itself, which I would be delighted to deliver, Master Nice. That is a hybrid court with strong elements of both seeking justice for those who deny involvement, along with reconciliation where there has been an, ad an admission of guilt. So the one sentence summary. I am now an older judge who believes in international criminal justice, but I recognize its imperfections and I admit that it is only part of a broader picture, and the judiciary should work alongside other solutions when faced with dire events, if they are capable of being effective, so long as we do not follow the South American model of yesteryear, when dictators accorded amnesties to themselves. Do you remember General Pinochet? 
justice and reconciliation should be, can be, amicable bedfellows. Before I ask Master Straw and Lord Justice Fulford to round two, can I throw out as my 30-second contribution ahead of question and answer that they confront one of the more obvious imperfections as a matter of our own knowledge and experience, Myanmar, in which I think neither of them has any personal uh, experience or engagement. Here was a country where it was seen a long time ago that terrible things were being done by people in charge. It was known that a justice mechanism should be imposed, but then when the country opened up, if you went to the Foreign Office in days well after the Master Straw was there, the enthusiasm for a justice mechanism had disappeared because commerce and tourism was on top. And it is only by the extraordinary events following multiple deaths on the Bangladesh border that the problem has now been brought back to possibly within the justice arena. And so, gentlemen, how should we look at a problem like that from your two perspectives, Master Straw? Uh, well, how you, how you look at it is, is first to decide what you think should be done. Um, and uh, in my view, if, if, it were, if it were possible uh, to bring uh, some of the principally army generals um, to uh, justice uh, for uh, what has happened, uh, that would be an admirable thing. I mean, the, the, uh, in respect of the Rohingya uh, peoples and others. Uh, the, the second is then what, what can you do? And this is a, uh, and if you're foreign secretary, you're faced with the imperfections of the world all, all the time. And the um, Sudan didn't have uh, many friends. Um, China traditionally had uh, protected uh, Myanmar from any kind of censure inside the, the, the Security Council. As far as I know, um, the Justice Fulford is the expert here. I don't think that uh, Myanmar, Burma, uh, is a state party of the ICC treaty. Uh, I thought. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, S so sorry. So I'll, I'll speak close to the microphone. I think that's that's the trick. I'm very sorry. Um, you're right about the acoustics. Um, so I said, so, uh, the Myanmar Burma is not a state party to the uh, ICC, so if you wanted to, the ICC to be involved, you'd have to get the Security Council um, to agree, uh, and that would require, um, in, in practice, even if, if, even if we were pushing it, uh, and I can't speak for the current government, although, brackets, I'm happy to... I mean, I'm in a very wide uh, circle, actually, since no one appears to be able to speak for the current government, but we'll <laughs> just put that on one side. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the, um, it, would, it would require ag agreement by uh, the United States, which in, in current uh, the US government they would not give, because President Trump is absolutely implacably opposed to the ICC. Uh, and I doubt that China would. So you then have to find other alternative uh, means. It, it's a, it's a double-headed monster. The, 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 the first is if the state isn't um, signed up to the court, then you effectively need a Security Council resolution, and you've got most particularly the America, the Russian, and the Chinese veto sitting waiting. Um, that can be got over, but it's difficult. The second problem, though, I think is, is as equally grave. When I was first appointed to the ICC, at my very first meeting with the then legal advisor in, the, in his room in that magnificent building just off St. James's Park, um, and as my very first question, I asked when the international community intended to create the rapid reaction force that was going to go into places like Burma to arrest the leading perpetrators. 
Um, and I was told that I really ought to very rapidly forget any ideas of that kind, um, because my credibility as a judge at the ICC would take a nosedive um, if I was to go around expressing the view that that sort of thing was um, going to happen. The, the real problem is that the international community has incredibly honorably and valiantly set up the international criminal court. But it has then said, you must now get on and to a very large extent do all these things by yourself. The ICC does not have an army, it doesn't have a police force, it doesn't have the mechanism for going out there and arresting those um, who face indictments issued by that court. And I'm afraid it really does mean that the international community needs to recognize that there is a continuing responsibility both to arrest those who are alleged to have committed egregious crimes but also, and here I go back to the absolutely critical factor that Jeffrey raised earlier, that for these institutions to be credible, there, has to be, there have to be proper reparations to the victims. And that requires funding by the international community. And those are the two areas where I think currently there is real weakness in the international justice model. Sorry, that was another... You were allowed 10 minutes, both of you, but before I throw it open to the audience, can I try a couple more uh, testing questions? Because I started off by saying, what would this citizen of the world think if international criminal justice is rationed out? So what would they think, gentlemen, about the fact that the Vietnam peace came with no judicial oversight of any kind? Or, and a second question, then I'll shut up, what about the fact that the International Criminal Court, Lord Justice Fulford, is regarded, rightly or wrongly, as being nervous of engaging in any issue that touches Israel? So I, I, I don't think you can um, pose these as either rules, that on the one hand you've got a perfect conception of how justice ought to be delivered, that there ought to be involvement in some of the things that have gone on, are going on in the West and other places in the world, and that if you don't secure that, then in a sense the whole thing is undermined and it has no value. I, I just don't subscribe to that at all. I, I think there are phenomenal things that have been done by the ad hocs, by Nuremberg, to an extent by the ICC, that are well worth banking in themselves. They have demonstrated that international criminal justice really can work, but it has not gone nearly far enough. That's not the responsibility of the tribunals or the court. That is the responsibility of the international community who has got to ensure that the reach of that jurisdiction is sufficiently long as to mean that it's not just failed states in Africa, but it is other places in the world where people are doing horrible things to others who need to be uh, made accountable by standing trial. Uh, on, on Vietnam, I mean, I... I don't, I think it's impossible to speculate as to what, what impact uh, a trial system would have had uh, on the, what became a peace in Vietnam, except that um, you know, some would have argued that you would have had to have the President of the United States and Robert McNamara, the Defense Secretary, as well as the Viet Cong leaders. Um, and I'm not sure that would have contributed to the peace that was uh, achieved at a price of uh, a great deal of bloodshed. So in, there are some cases, I think, where uh, the international criminal system won't, I mean, first of all, 
it would be impossible to get agreement, but even if it were possible to get agreement, um, I'm not entirely clear what it, what it would achieve. Um, the question of Israel is an, is an interesting one. Um, I mean, for the time being, there is absolutely no possibility of Israel uh, being subject to ICC jurisdiction, uh, not least because the United States and probably the UK and France and likely uh, Russia uh, and possibly China would all veto um, a reference uh, to the ICC. What, I mean, I'm not here to, to defend either the Israelis or um, the uh, jihadist terrorists who oppose them. Um, what Israel would say is that they have a, a, a far better justice system than operates anywhere else in their neighborhood. Uh, that's almost certainly true, by the way. Um, and that, uh, that their experience in the UN Human Rights Council is such that um, they don't get a hearing there um, and other countries with unquestionably far more egregious records um, have uh, uh, th their uh, poor conduct uh, brushed aside. But I mean, it, it goes back to the point that both Aga and uh, Paul said I've been making, uh, Master and I, which is, is that there are simply limits uh, to these institutions. Um, they, I think, are helpful in certain situations, and I'm come back to the point I made in my introduction. I'm absolutely clear that the uh, Yugoslav Tribunal has been of very considerable moment in securing the peace there and in the, the, the building up of political institutions to norms that we would find acceptable. I think it also helped in a question Sierra Leone and uh, in Rwanda. Um, but when it came, comes to you know, really huge conflicts like uh, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, then they may, where uh, there was no, no, it was very different from uh, the Second World War where, there, where, where the Nazis and the, uh, the Japanese were, were uh, clearly the perpetrators of that war, um, then I think that um, the, the use of uh, international criminal tribunals is more open to question, plus the fact it, 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 uh, you would never get agreement for, for them. Thank you very much. And uh, before I now throw it open to questions, it seems to me that uh, Master Straw's last answer, or observations rather, included the heart of the matter, or heart, the heart of one of the matters. Many would argue that both the leaders of the Viet Cong and American presidents and secretaries of state should have stood trial for that conflict, which was of pretty well unparalleled proportions. But as Master Straw says, the bloodshed in bringing people to trial would have made that process on some uh, calibration unworth what not worthwhile. And that is the heart of the problem. There's a microphone, someone. First question, remember the rules, please. Hi, um, I just want to start saying by saying that considering the topic of conversation, I'm quite disappointed that Master Straw hasn't raised his decision uh, to appease General Pinochet. And I just want to ask whether he regrets his decision as Home Secretary to appease a dictator who killed thousands of people and denied Chilean people from receiving adequate restitution. Thank you very much. We want matters put in principle, not on personal basis, but please answer it. I'm very happy to answer it. I certainly did not uh, appease uh, General Pinochet, though I understand why you have that feeling. What I did in the end, after I, I'd had him uh, detained in this country for 16 months, uh, was release him on medical grounds because of overwhelming evidence uh, from uh, medical practitioners brought in by, as it were, by the prosecution, who to my surprise and the Home Office's surprise, uh, said that, that he was not fit to stand trial. Uh, that, and I uh, spent a long time trying to work out if there was a way in which I could resist uh, that decision. Um, I, re I regret that I had to make the decision. I thought he should, should have gone to trial. I thought the evidence uh, was sufficiently clear, and that was confirmed by not one, uh, but uh, two 
uh, decisions of the uh, then law lords. Uh, but but I, 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 I regret, yes, I do, the conclusion to it. Um, but I'm happy uh, to explain to anybody why I came to that decision. Next question, please. Over here. Can, can the justice side of the equation be split into um, two sections, if not more? Um, the first is exposing what has happened um, and, if possible, who is responsible. And then the second, what we might call full justice, is then criminal accountability for obviously identified and named people. Now, just focusing on the first, and focusing on victims. <clears throat> if one reads Hannah Arendt, Primo Levi, the great professor at Yale now, Professor Tim Schneider, the greatest insult surely to victims is that they should be forgotten, unrecognized, and that even the events surrounding their ordeals should be forgotten. And um, should not resources at least as much be put into that exposure. Not least because justice is never attainable. The biggest atrocities have so many perpetrators, direct and indirect. Thank you, Master. We Strong. might as well face it's impossible. I'll just check that you've been heard. Check, Master Strong. I heard more. Than... I'm Pat Paddy, I, I agree that um, what is often looked for from international courts is both a kind of a, a writing of the history to what happened, but in the context of particular criminal allegations that are made against those who are on trial. It, it's not easy to do both, and having been there, um, I, I feel that quite acutely, because the more you go off into general matters of history, the more that those on trial complain that the process that relates to them, which should be focused on their criminality as alleged, is somehow being diluted. Um, and you risk already lengthy proceedings stretching on till the end of time. I think that the statute of the International Criminal Court, in a really imaginative way, went quite a long way to squaring or to resolving that problem by what I referred to earlier as the active participation by victims in the proceedings before the court, where um, there is not only a dedicated unit within the ICC for the representation of victims, they have well, not one counsel each. There is a proper um, designation of counsel so as to make sure that people's views are properly aired and expressed. It's, it's really fragile, and it's very difficult. And I think only time will tell whether this really gains the confidence of the international community. But I do think that, particularly in the early trial, that was really successful. And there was a sense that broad there's a broad range of opinion from the communities that are affected in a term in the Democratic Republic of Congo really did have their voice listened to. I mean, it, your, your suggestion was that, that uh, as it were, the, the, these investigations or considerations should be split, so you'd have a, a general consideration um, where there would no particular perpetrators named or not possible to name one and then maybe have, tr have trials. I think the, the problem about a, a general investigations uh, is either they, they, they find it very difficult to reach conclusions because they uh, come to uh, generalized uh, comments and condemnations or uh, they are able to reach conclusions in, and they start to name individuals in which case you're straight down the road of a, of a trial process. Um, and, I, if, if, and in most of the conflicts I can uh, think of uh, in recent decades 
there have been, I mean, however kept, I mean, war is, and civil war particularly, by its nature, extremely violent and chaotic, and particularly chaotic, nonetheless, there are clear leaders involved in, in um, uh, civil war, as, w as well as in uh, war between uh, state parties. Um, and so I think if, if you're going to follow this process, it, it has to be where you are seeking to identify and then to take to trial named perpetrators. I, I frankly don't see the point of, uh, for historians, I've got, there's a great role for historians in this, but not, not, I think, for judicial investigators, as it were, to just write the history uh, without writing more. And, Jeff, if I could just add, I, I think this also is the space where truth and reconciliation commissions and um, criminal courts can work alongside each other. That, in, in a sense, is a different function to be carried out by both. Uh, it may be um, that uh, Master O'Connor was also pointing up the fact that there's a, a, a gross unfairness in, for example, the Security Council keeping whole ranges of victims from any judicial process, whereas others are exposed and they come to the end of their lives with their suffering the subject of no consideration by judicial process at all. Over there, I think. Uh, as well as just uh, providing justice for victims, uh, the other purpose of the war tribunals, the war crimes tribunals uh, system, uh, has been to deter warlords and dictators from committing war crimes in the future. We've now had these tribunals since Nuremberg, and I wonder whether the two speakers have any view as to the effectiveness of deterrence. By nature, these are difficult questions to answer because they involve going into the minds of rather nasty people. I don't know whether anything has been written about it or whether there have been any studies, but I wonder whether you have any personal reflections. I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to, as you say, to there have been fewer mass murderers as a result, you know, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you get there? I, I think, oh, I'm gonna link this to something else, actually. Um, the very strong anecdotal reports have been that um, those working in the armed forces, not only in this country, but in other countries, have been very concerned indeed to make sure that they are given very clear rules of engagement before they go into battle because there is now the new element of a possible referral to the ICC if they get it wrong. Now, these obviously aren't the kind of monsters that you're referring to, but I think it is a demonstration of how the existence of the court has had a real restraining effect on people's behavior. Now, regular soldiers, they're not the same as Charles Taylor from Liberia. But I think it's worth just remembering what happened to him. Um, he thought he was going to be able to live out his life with his ill-gotten gains in Nigeria but the climate changed uh, and he faced trial and I think he's still in, still in custody. Now, I would be surprised if that has had absolutely no effect at all on those who are considering going out and committing genocide. Yes, I mean, just to confirm the, the, uh, Adrian Fulford's second point, I mean, I, I'm, having been heavily involved when I was Foreign Secretary in uh, trying, uh, well, persuading uh, and having, getting some cooperation, President Obasanjo of Nigeria, uh, to ensure that Charles Taylor stayed incarcerated and was brought to trial. I'm not in any doubt that in West Africa, the example of Charles Taylor, Taylor uh, is a check on uh, people's behavior. Uh, Adrian is absolutely right about the effect that um, the ICC uh, has had and continues to have on the behavior of, of uh, uh, British soldiers I mean, and, and the rules of engagement and the fact that um, for, for both the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, uh, minister, senior ministers were quite rightly challenged um, to set out what were the, the rules of engagement, 
what were we asking uh, the soldiers uh, and other service personnel to, to do, and what was outside the limits? Um, and that, is, as well as other things, like the fact that um, because of the internet and mobile telephony and so on, uh, evidence uh, of atrocities it is much more I easily available and has made a very significant difference to the behavior of, uh, say, our, our troops. You, you, it's sort of inconceivable that the, the kind of uh, atrocities that took place by uh, British soldiers, for example, in Kenya uh, uh, during the independence struggles and a number of other theaters uh, could take place uh, today. Um, on, on whether there are um, sort of putative uh, dictators uh, in less well-governed areas who think they can get away with it, I think, I think for, for some, if they're not complete um, psychopathic fanatics, um, as some jihadist terrorists are, I think that it does act as a check. If they claim to have the trappings of um, statehood around them, and be heads of state, then, then I, my strong instinct, but it can be no more for the reasons you, you su suggest, is that uh, the establishment of these institutions and their effectiveness, as shown by the number of people brought to trial, and both the number of people convicted and the numbers acquitted, um, is gradually moderating bad behavior. The, the president of the Sudan has not been shopping in Bond Street yeah. for a very, very long time. Um, he is able to travel only to a very few number of countries in Africa who have let it be known that they won't arrest him should he pitch up um, on their territory. Now, that's quite a restriction on a head of state who for more than a decade has not been able to move effectively outside his own country. Hmm. I think that and, uh, but that's something we did, uh, which I hope will be weighed in the balance. Uh, <coughs> Over there, please. Although I suppose it should be borne in mind that President al-Bashir promised two elections ago to stand down. Who knows whether his promise was genuine, in which case Sudan would have been handed over probably to a more modern Western-inclined uh, rule that he stayed in office to enjoy the fruits of head of state immunity. Uh, Master Stroh, you gave the example at the outset of the pardon for the Price sisters, and I just thought that there's a, a, an obvious contrast or perceived contrast, perhaps, the recent news about British soldiers facing prosecution for historical crimes. I was interested in the panel's view to what extent you thought maybe inconsistencies in the administration of justice for historic crimes or perceived inconsistencies could be even a greater threat to peace than no administration at all. Well, what, I think it's possible to, to answer whether they, they're a greater threat uh, than no administration of justice at all, but I, I entirely accept your point about the fact that um, there has to be an even-handed approach here. Um, uh, and uh, for certain, the Price sisters, sisters and many other um, really serious criminals uh, were uh, let out of prison well before their sentence end as a part as a result of that peace, peace process, and there is now one soldier facing trial in respect of uh, his alleged uh, misconduct on Bloody Sunday. Um, and if you're saying to me that's inconsistent, I agree. This is a question from Master Straw. Um, what would you say to those people who say that Tony Blair should be brought before the ICC? Uh, yes, I, I thought I could be getting one. Well, <laughs> uh, what I'd say first of all is, is, is uh, and I was going to mention this earlier, but uh, it's, it's uh, not only Tony Blair who's, who it said should be brought before the ICC, uh, but it's me too. Uh, and it, it's, it's slack and a, 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 a minor benefit of Brexit uh, perhaps the only benefit of Brexit, uh, uh, pardoning those who take a different view from me, uh, has been that um, people now greet me on the tube like a long-lost friend uh, and say how life was good uh, in the days when uh, people like me were in government. Uh, for quite a period after I ceased to travel around with policemen, um, I used to be shouted at on the tube uh, and 
people uh, said, suggested in um, very straightforward language uh, that I should be, an, I was a war criminal and I should be in The Hague. So, um, and it would be uh, Tony Blair and me together. Uh, what I, uh, the serious answer I, I'd, uh, well, it was a pretty serious answer. Uh, the serious answer I, I'd give to uh, this is that we acted lawfully. Um, that may not be a view that you share, um, but uh, we did take legal advice. Um, we had legal advice from the Attorney General, who was the, the government's law officer, and he, he, and he, just going back to what I was saying a moment ago about the military challenging us, um, he was, the, the Attorney was asked to answer a very clear exam question. Would military action against uh, Saddam Hussein on this basis uh, be lawful or not? And he said it was lawful. Um, so, uh, I, uh, uh, Lord Justice Fulford may say, no, I should still be there, taken uh, to The Hague, but subject that I think I've got a pretty good defence. <coughs> He's saying nothing. Uh, just following on the question uh, or the answer about rules of engagement, um, I'd like to ask a question about uh, Baha Musa and the death of Baha Musa. I should just declare an interest. I acted for Captain Derek Kilo, late of the Royal Army Medical Corps. He was attached to the Queen's uh, Lancashire Regiment. Why is it that more senior officers weren't uh, disciplined or indicted for what happened? I, I, I have no idea, is the answer. I, I mean, I. I, I, I mean, I, I can't speculate as to why that was. I uh, had nothing whatever to do with the decision to prosecute. I have no idea. I understand the point you're making, but that's the answer. Any other questions? I'm not going to let our speakers go quite through, because underlying the proposed discussion was the issue as whether, in a modern age, we should have a universal expectation that justice will be applied where egregious crimes are committed in conflict. And how you deal with that universal expectation generated over the last 70 years, starting with the 1948 Declaration and the processes of courts that have developed. And I'd like our speakers to deal with one example, um, uh, picking up on Master O'Connor's point, I think, of what happens when any expectation of universal jurisdiction failed or is failed. Not just in the Second World War crimes when neither Hiroshima nor um, Dresden were the subject of trials of the Allies um, in the same way as the Germans and the Japanese had been tried, but what do our speakers say to the fact that the comfort women of Japan, the sexual slaves, were never considered for trial and had to wait 50 years until but an informal tribunal gave them whatever solace you get for some resolution of your suffering by a judicial or a quasi-judicial process. Because that is an example of the need, if we can meet it, of universality of delivering judicial oversight of criminality in conflict. There's, there's I mean, it, it is so self-evident that um, along with expense and the length of time that trials take, that the fact that they, <coughs> it tends to be loses justice is a significant failure. For me, instead of remorselessly beating ourselves up about that, the reaction ought to be that which has been taken by Fatou Ben Souda, um, prosecutor of the ICC, who I think it's fair to say, has been doing everything in her power to take the call out of Africa and to launch investigations, preliminary inquiries, which if they come to fruit, will mean that she will seek indictments 
from those um, who come from um, either Washington, London, or other Western capitals, rather than those who were in uh, what historically have been called third world countries, uh, where they were on the, the losing side in a war. That, for me, is the appropriate reaction to the absolutely correct observation that you made. That those who have responsibility for these things should ensure, should use all their best endeavors to make these institutions even-handed in the way that they go about prosecuting. I, I agree with that in principle. Um, you, uh, Master Mice, referred in, in an earlier question to, uh, I paraphrase, but the, the fact that one or other of the permanent members of the Security Council might block uh, particular inquiries. Uh, and that uh, is, is a reality. It's a sort of ex a indication of the ray of polity uh, which informs the way the, the United Nations operates. Um, those who say that we shouldn't have that, say the veto powers in, in the, uh, the Security Council, uh, I think need to consider what the alternative to that will be uh, or would be. Um, because, if, I mean, if the, and the alternative, in my judgment, would be a far less good system, uh, and we drift down the, the route that the League of Nations took, where decisions were effectively taken, made by uh, majority vote. The United States had, had nothing whatever to do with the uh, League of Nations, withdrew from it, um, and international governance uh, collapsed uh, towards the end of the 1930s. Now, the current system is very far from perfect, but the fact that through the agency of the five permanent uh, members of the, of, of the Security Council, you have got the major power blocks in the world represented, does ensure that when the Security Council makes a decision, it does so with a con considerable degree of authority. And it's effectively, the UN is, is there saying, well, we can't do everything. We can only do things by agreement. Uh, but when we do agree, we can be powerful. Uh, that seems to be better than the alternative of, of a, a collapse. I, uh, they, they, you know, there used to be a, an, uh, a, an idea of we, we, somehow you could start up a world government. Um, you will never, in my view, achieve that. What we have been able to achieve in post-war is the establishment uh, to a remarkable degree, if you think where we started, of international norms and rules-based systems of behavior. Um, please God that they are able to survive uh, President Trump, um, uh, who seems to be, uh, I mean, I make this as a serious point, believe that um, the, the US should not be sub subject to any kind of international norms. But I think, I think uh, that uh, the system will survive that. On, on your sub sp specific question about comfort women, yes, it, uh, and, and if from, uh, who were, these were um, a South Korean comfort women, so-called comfort women, who were used by uh, Japanese soldiers. Yes, that's outrageous. Uh, and it's terrible that it's taken that long uh, to get justice for them. What's interesting, however, is that there are a group of Vietnamese women uh, who, were sub, who, were, who were forced into uh, being comfort women uh, by the South Korean army, when the South Korean uh, army was, uh, 180,000 of them were fighting alongside the United States in Vietnam. Their offspring are known, uh, are mixed race, uh, are known as the Lai Dai Han. Uh, and uh, they are having considerable difficulty in getting any kind of recognition at all by the same South Korean government, which has itself been campaigned successfully for justice on behalf of the, its own comfort women who were so abused by the Japanese. Um, uh, I'm trying to draw this inconsistency to the attention of the South Koreans uh, with some difficulty. Unless anybody has something they're dying to say, we will now end with a reception afterwards where you will be able to speak to speakers, to whom we are extremely indebted for 
coming, giving us of their time and speaking so candidly about matters of which they're expert, and I'm sure you'd like to express your gratitude to Master Straw and Lord Justice Fulford in the usual way.